Hello, Bill. Good morning from Chicago. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. And uh, Bill, you are our, our eyes and ears. Um, watching, obviously, we're watching the Democratic National Convention on TV. How's it different being uh, in the Windy City? Uh, well, I definitely feel like, I mean, I, I catch certain clips after the fact. Uh, but I do think there is a different rhythm when you're in the room, particularly uh, if you're there from the beginning. I mean, so I don't know, if, I don't, I don't know how much this, this gets into the in the, the media, but there's been a lot of problems with people getting into the building. Yes, um, long, long lines, logistical issues. It takes people, what, 45 minutes to get there? So if you're going around from party to party to party and you show up at 6.30 p.m., yeah, you have that problem. It's not the way that Bill Sher uh, plays the convention game. <laughs> uh, uh, I was in my seat at 2.30 p.m. listening to the sound checks. But I pick my seat. I, I'm at, I'm in the mezzanine, you know, front row. Got a little extra leg room because nobody in front of me. And I just park. I I, yeah. I eat a huge lunch before I get there, and I park myself for the night. So you're and not well, on, you're not on the floor where the delegates are. No, you're I don't. Have, I don't have a floor pass. Um, yeah. But uh, I, you can apply to get half hour floor passes. Uh, and so I actually was eligible for one like at 5.30 p.m. on Monday, but I, I Monday I got there too late. Monday I, Monday I had to deal with lines because I flew in and I got in around uh, three o'clock. And so getting from the airport to where I was staying to the hall was more of an ordeal, but we got in. Um, yeah. uh, yesterday I was at two o'clock and uh, I didn't have, I didn't get a floor pass in a floor pass is It's a little fun, but I have been in conventions where I get out of my seat and I can't get back in. Yeah. So I'm just like super protective. Don't go anywhere and watch the show. And so you, you feel more of the buildup to the bigger moments. I think when you, when you're watching on TV and all the, the, the lesser time is, filled up with commentary, um, the big moments don't hit as big, in my opinion. Uh, and so there's a part where I thought the roll call was a lot of fun. And then between like 8 and 9.30, you know, the speeches were, you know, fine. Nothing too exciting. Uh, and and then, when, and then Doug Edmoff comes in, and it's, it's, yeah. it gets a bit more exciting. And then Michelle yeah, well, comes should, in, should, it's like, I boom. Say, I should say we're recording this on a Wednesday morning. Yeah. So we've had, um, we've had the uh, uh, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton night. That was, that was Monday. Then we've had uh, Doug Imhoff, uh, Michelle Obama, Barack Obama night. That was last night. Tonight there will be Tim Walls night. And then, of course, Thursday night is going to be uh, – Kamala Harris. So we're about halfway through. Um, but I'm sorry, I, I just wanted to put that in context. Sure. But, but I used to go back to uh, to Monday night because I was in my seat Monday. I think I got in like six. I think I got in six thirty into my seat, so I still got a good seat. Um, and if you know, peak, there were these long lines outside. People still kind of filtering in. It's a little chit chatty on the floor. Not everyone is totally focused on the speaker. Uh, for most of the seven o'clock hour, and then Kamala comes out around eight, which people weren't expecting, and it's like a bolt of lightning mm. goes through the room. So, like feeling that vibe shift in the room, uh, you know, maybe it doesn't like completely you know change your universe and your understanding of what's happening, but I did feel like on Monday uh, this couple excitement for Kamala to a point where you get to Joe Biden at the other night and, and it's a little bit of like oh you're right we're here to this is Biden night Supposed yeah. to, we well, had to thank you Joe stuff late I mean it was like 11 30 by the time Biden got on everything's late I mean Barack so this isn't just 
this wasn't just an attempt to sort of sideline Joe Biden. I mean, Barack Obama probably spoke around 1130 uh, the next night. Well, I think it was I think it was a I mean, I, you know, we're in central time. So it was 10 o'clock for us. I, I mean, yeah. I was looking at the schedule. Like They were on time what they planned to do on Tuesday, which was not the case on Monday. Yeah, I, Obama was I'm scheduled East for 11 State. o'clock at night. I'm Eastern Standard Time, my friend. Yeah. That, that's the real time. That's right. what everyone should operate on. You know. On Eastern Time, Obama was scheduled for 11 o'clock. <laughs> uh, you might think it's a bad choice, but that's what they planned. Have you, no, have, have you seen any celebrities in the wild, like famous people that you've just sort of, not on stage, but that you've bumped into at Starbucks or something? Uh, well, walking in on Monday in the security line, uh, Spike Lee was like two people behind me. Uh, and, uh, I met Mary Trump cause we actually have a common friend who lives near me in, in Northampton and she was actually just behind me in the security line. So I, I met her briefly there. Um, and, uh, Chuck Todd walked past me yesterday. Cool. Uh, but for the most part, you know, I'm sitting in my seat, so I'm not, I'm not seeing a lot of folks. Yeah. Let's just say the Bill Share experience is very different from the Matt Lewis experience. <laughs> uh, so you have not been out. Uh, you you are bright eyed and bushy tailed. You look like you've actually somewhat rested. My experience at conventions is uh, is, is probably boozier uh, and and less pro- possibly less productive than yours. I mean, I'm literally getting in my seat, watching the show, driving home, writing my piece, going to bed at three in the morning, getting about five hours of sleep, new day. Um, yeah, I, I, I just don't see, I'm just not, one, I'm not a big party guy. Uh, and two, like I'm, I'm here to report on it. I might as well report on it. But don't you think a lot of the benefit to being there is like the networking, the, the conversations that you have, uh, you know, at a party or at a, at a whatever. I mean, they, yeah. I'm sure there's a ton of, when I say party, these are not like necessarily illicit affairs. Like <laughs> I, I went to one, uh, the Philadelphia convention in 2000 and we went out like on a yacht or something or some mm-hmm. sort of a boat. I went to like the BAM pack, Black America's pack through like a party. They thought I was Rick Lazio famously. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, you, you can, it's, it's, um, it, you you can have good conversations and 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 make friends and meet people there. If I like, if I was a better networker, I would have a, my whole career would be different if I was a good networker. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, my this is my fifth my fifth Democratic convention. I've never got gone to a Republican one. Um, and when you know, two thousand four was the first blogger credentialed convention, and we definitely actually had this notion we're, we're going to cover this better than the dinosaur media. And I was scurrying around to a lot of, you know, caucus breakfasts and, you know, progressive events outside the hall. I was trying to see as much as I could. And I just wasn't getting that much out of it. Um, I was furiously trying to like do blog posts throughout the day and like find little tidbits of information. And they they weren't very good tidbits. No. Uh, and sometimes I was having a hard time getting into the hall because I was spending so much time outside the hall. So it really took me like three conventions. I was like, you know, what? I'm just going to get in the hall. Yeah, I'm not going to waste. I mean, I think there are other. Know. Do you have Wi Fi in the hall? Are you able to do tweeting from? You're tweeting from the hall, right? I obviously. am. Tw- I'm tweeting my five G. When I got in yesterday, like at two thirty, the Wi Fi worked. And as people kind of came in, it started to not work. Mm. Uh, so I couldn't do much on my laptop. At that point, but I could, but the five G was working, so I could still tweet some. By the way, let me say here where I am here in West Virginia, but not that far from DC. Uh, it's like sixty degrees or something. It's unbelievable. It's so you're. I don't know what the weather's like in Chicago. It's but very, nice. Missing, very nice, very nice, seventy very sunny, cool. perfect. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. It's, it's autumnal, Bill. I'm wearing my autumn outfit today. <laughs> well, then, what's when I had? I, I just saw a thread on Blue Sky. I'm not. I'm not even on Blue Sky that much, but I happened to go on it briefly. And Hunter Walker, who I think he still writes for Talking Points Memo, or at least he did, uh, was telling a whole thing about. He's and he's not here now, but he's been before, uh, and he was sort of having this whole discussion about media griping about access and logistics and stuff. Uh, 
and he was one of the points he was making was it is a really good it, it it's a propaganda show you should treat it as such uh but there is value for beat reporter uh to network outside the hall particularly at things like the state breakfast there's always breakfasts mm-hmm. early in the morning for the the state delegations and different caucuses and stuff and so if you want to build up your rolodex that makes a lot of sense uh i just uh, i'm not really a b reporter i don't i don't i'm not well sourced i don't have a i don't have a lot of side conversations it's not how i do what i do uh so it's i don't find it productive for my time but i do think for those who are looking to be you know, working political journalist, that does make a lot of sense. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, so if you're a member of the DMZ Army, uh, you can find them at the mezzanine. Get there early. You get there at six, you might be able to get a- I've been, a I've been section uh, 205 each night. You okay. know, it's like the closest to the exit. <laughs> Are you going to do, you should do selfies. Like, did you see, um, uh, not Jennifer Granholm, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, the way that she takes selfies now? Have you seen this? Yeah. Did she use the selfie stick? No, no, no. She has all the people who want to take pictures with her line up and they like take their phones like this and then mm-hmm. she just stands behind them and goes from person to person. So, Bill, you, you should do that at the convention for the DMZ Army. Okay, all right. I'm sure there's a clamoring of people to uh, to meet you and probably at, where's Matt? Where's Matt? Matt's not here? How's that possible? We, we need to do a convention together, Matt. We totally do. Um, okay, what has been so again, we're we're halfway through this thing and we haven't gotten to uh to the climax, obviously, but um I'm talking about the convention. Uh but so far, what who's the best? Who's the best speaker you saw? I mean Michelle's the best speaker. I mean Michelle's probably the best speaker I've seen in my life. Uh, I saw wow. someone, you know, trip I've seen some conservatives mocking her about her sort of uh claims to uh middle middle class status by point she got paid three seven fifty grand for a one hour speech in Germany. I'm like, she owed every freaking dollar of that speech. <laughs> she is the best speaker ever. Well look. No, but when she there was a part where she's talking about generational wealth. She understands that most of us will never be afforded the grace of failing forward. We will never benefit from the affirmative action of generational wealth. business, if we bankrupt a business or choke in a crisis, we don't get a second, third, or fourth chance. If things don't go our way, we don't have the luxury of whining or cheating others to get further ahead. No. We don't get to change the rules so we always win. If we see a mountain in front of us, we don't expect there to be an escalator waiting to take us to the top. No. We put our heads down. We get to work. In America, we do something. And- I thought that she that resonated. Now, the problem is that the Obama's kids <laughs> do enjoy <laughs> generational wealth. And so coming from her... I I get it, but maybe there could be a little bit of uh, well. It's tough for Sasha Malia if they would have run for office and they and their their opponents throw Michelle's words back in their face. But uh, I still think Michelle's point resonates, considering at least in the context of what they're up against right now with with Donald Trump, uh, and uh, just as a, as part of the broader discussion about. Uh, you know, DEI and qualifications and the way people are being held to different standards. Uh, I mean, there are people on the right who are literally saying she slept her way to the top because she had a relationship with Willie Brown. You know, so there's all these things that uh, I, I'm seeing people, uh, and maybe, maybe maybe you have a different take on this, Matt. Um, uh, but, you know, Tim Walls is getting dinged more and more for embellishments and omissions and things of that nature. Uh, well, the, the most I'm recent, not... Bill, the most recent is he said that or he's he strongly suggested on I think it was on Morning Joe that his daughter was born because of IVF. Look, that includes IVF. And this gets personal for me and my family. 
When my wife and I decided to have children, we spent years going through infertility treatments. And I remember praying every night for a call for good news. The pit in my stomach when the phone rang and the agony when we heard that the treatments hadn't worked. So it wasn't by chance that when we welcomed our daughter into the world, we named her Hope. Right. Which is not technically true. Right. I mean, only there are, I've seen some people argue, so they had a different procedure called IUI, which doesn't involve any discarding of embryos. And since it's more of a direct, you know, insemination, um, I've heard some people argue, well, some people use IVF kind of colloquially and broadly to encompass all sorts of uh, infertility treatments. Um, I mean, it is it is in vitro, right? I mean, if I'm using the, the term correctly, as a, as a technical matter, if you're in, inseminating something that's still in vitro, but again, I'm not. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'm. Not, I'm not the best person I mean, to ask. I'm, I'm, I am. I am not qualified to address right. this one, but I. I do know that that has come up and that has been the, right. I think that's the latest, but, but see, Bill, I think there is a danger that you, you start to get a pattern yes. of, of the, that's the problem. It's not right. whether, well, it's not really IVF, mm. but it's sort of IVF, but it's like, well, but this is the latest example of that. I get that. This is the kind of card they played on Al Gore in 2000, a serial exaggerator, um, well, we're running against Donald Trump for Pete's sake. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, point. And uh, you know, our good friend Con Carroll, um, former uh, Blogging Heads uh, partner here, you know, I heard him. I, I, I saw him do a tweet saying, "So Tim Walls is the pathological liar," and I didn't want to get into it, but I'll get into it with you. Uh, I mean, Donald Trump is literally a pathological liar. Uh, you just told a story about going down a helicopter with Lee Brown, which is like not true every which way, uh, and has yet to cop to it. Um, so, you know, is Tim Walls a saint? Probably not. Uh, is he the first politician to embellish things? Probably not. Uh, uh, but what, what, did, but what did you make of, um, what did you make of, 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 uh, Michelle Obama's line about a black job, about the job that well, Donald Trump may discover the job he's currently running for as a black job. <laughs> that seems you know, to be the, the, uh, the line that brought down the house. Well, that and the affirmative action of, of, of generational wealth, like those th those two are real one-two punches. Uh, and, you know, the, obviously the, the black jobs line hit really hard in the hall. I, I, I want to know. I want to know. Who's going to tell him? Who's going to tell him that the job he's currently seeking might just be one of those black jobs? There was a part of me in the moment that said, I wonder how Kamala feels about this one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wonder how this is going to play, you know, shorn of broader context. Uh, and I Wait, saw are some... Are you saying because in order to get the joke, you would have to know that Donald Trump talked about, quote unquote, black jobs. And so the average person watching may not get it. Or are you saying that... Kamala might not want to talk about identity politics or make that such a, a focal. Well, all, all of it, all of it. Um, I mean, it, it could be looked at out of context as some kind of flex that this is a black job, not a white job. You know, we right. it's like Will Smith saying July 4th, my weekend. The, fu um, the future is female, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> it's, it's exclusive. It's right. Yeah. I mean, and I think in context. You know, the, the Trump talking about black jobs read to a lot of Democrats as this is ridiculous that you, you're putting an identity on jobs. And he was doing that to pit blacks against Latinos, blacks against immigrants. Uh, and, and to be a little charitable to Trump, again, I'm not in any way um, endorsing the idea that immigrants take jobs from black people. Um, uh, but he was speaking 
clumsily about that notion that a black person who has a job or black person who might want a certain job yeah. will this now was, not get it because an, an undocumented immigrant gets it. This is, uh, this is his, this is his binders full of women. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and, uh, but then of course this, this metastasized into like, what the heck's a black job? That's ridiculous. Jobs aren't, don't have color to them. Uh, and Michelle is mocking that concept. Uh, but again, out of context, it might seem like this is an identity play. Uh, so, I mean, and part of what I thought, and this is what I wrote about overnight, what I think is so incredible about Barack's speech, which I see as part of a 20 year narrative of him trying to show America how we can depolarize and chart a course mm -hmm. to navigating um, all of these uh, racial resentments that have that have bogged down the country. You know, he, he's showing how to get over uh, the negative aspects of identity politics. And uh, will the way Michelle handled it, you know, uh, muddy that anyway? I'm not, obviously, it's not the mm -hmm. intention. I'm not saying she deserves that knock, but we see how these things do get twisted around. So, uh, uh, so it's one that it raised my eyebrow a little bit. And yeah. this is, of course, before I heard what Brock had to say, but that raised my eyebrow a little bit in, in the moment. And by the way, my, my latest column for The Hill out this morning is on joy and how um, I really think that, you know, whether it's Ronald Reagan's sunny optimism or, or Barack Obama's hope and change, that uh, for a long time, being optimistic, being positive was um, was the way to go. And I think Reagan and Obama both did it really well, but there were plenty of imitators who wanted to appear to be happy warriors. But then since Donald Trump came down that escalator, obviously that is going out of style. And it's been about anger and bitterness and fear. And um, I think that Kamala Harris and Tim Walls have brilliantly taken the joy message and it's very explicit especially early in the night last night not not during prime time as much but you could just people were repeating the words joy um and uh and, and so i think it's it's been very clear that kamala harris and tim walls and maybe even you know i i would say and you know i've been a critic a critic of the selection of tim walls because i just thought josh shapiro was a better choice for a variety of reasons but if your goal is to brand yourself as a party and a team of joy, as a stark contrast to Trump and J.D. Vance, then Walls probably was the right pick. Now, uh, so by the way, you, I read your column in The Hill today about joy, so people should read that. Um, I've got the joy, 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 <laughs> joy down in my heart. That's I appreciate the Simpsons reference. Um, now, <laughs> I've seen you in the past, Matt be critical of Barack Obama. You know, back, we've been doing this a long time, Matt. Uh, um, maybe a lot of the, a lot of years. Yeah. Um, I think you were one who used to say that Obama presents himself as this great unifier, yet, you know, gets in his sucker punches at the same time. Yes. Uh, I think that certainly was true. Yes. And I saw some conservatives say the same about this speech on X, uh, overnight. Uh, do you, but I imagine you could probably say the same, say the same about Ronald Reagan. He wasn't all, all goodness yeah. and sweetness, but there yeah. was an overarching uh, optimism that uh, made whatever hardball politics he was also doing go down a whole lot easier. Yeah. Um, well, look, I, and so, I think we're, we're so desperate and hungry for any hope and optimism and joy after Donald Trump's style of, uh, you know, bitterness and anger and uh, American carnage that um, my tolerance for Obama's <laughs> jabs are <laughs> a lot higher. And it was refreshing. And I have to say also, Bill, I really liked what he had to say about uh, Joe Biden. And he said that history will remember that Joe Biden was. We needed a leader who was steady and brought people together, and was selfless enough to do the rarest thing there is in politics, 
putting his own ambition aside for the sake of the country. <laughs> History will remember Joe Biden as an outstanding president who defended democracy at a moment of great danger. And I am proud to call him my president, but I am even prouder to call him my friend. Um, I, I find it interesting that you say that because it, he didn't go heavy on it. There wasn't a huge chunk of speech mm -mm. about the Biden record, which is very different than, say, the Bill Clinton speech of 2012, which was, I mean, if I remember correctly, there's, there's, I think there's a part about his own record in there. Uh, I mean, Clinton, and, we'll, and I'm curious what he does tonight, uh, Clinton is always very big on reminding you about his record. Uh, but in the context of 2012, there was a lot of emphasis on the Obama record. Yeah. And so it wasn't seen as you know any kind of self-indulgent play for him. He was very magnanimous about how he was selling the Obama record, even though it's a guy who defeated his wife you know, in the primary four years prior. Uh, and Obama didn't go heavy on either Biden's record or his own record. There's a little bit, you know, a little bit for mm -hmm. Biden, a little bit, hey, Obamacare is popular now. Um, but, but Obama was, I think, mainly interested in political depolarization, which I think is kind of a cause he has long had and probably yeah. feels to a large extent, didn't complete, didn't complete that mission Obviously. as president and still Obviously. wants to see it go forward. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't, don't you know that all our problems were solved in 2016? <laughs> Um, I mean, there, there, there were there are both parallel passages, which I talk about in my piece today. You, there's there's parallel passages, not just from the 2004 keynote address when he was introduced to Much of America, from the 2008 More Perfect Union speech, which got him out of the Jeremiah Wright jam, uh, and the speech today. Um, so there, there's that through line, yeah. but there is, I think also a, a war weariness yeah. in last night's speech. There's, there, there, it, there was me a little less yeah. naivete, well, I mean, a little it, more understanding that the Obama, job was even harder than I he ever could have thought it would be back you know, 20 years ago. And Michelle Obama didn't say when they go low, we go high. Right. Cause there is, there was, there, in the context of what has come before and that's, yes. and what has come before is Donald Trump. Right. And so I so, think that. There, it's still a hopeful message. It's still an optimism, but now I think it is a more mature, uh, less quixotic uh, thing based there on was, what we've been through. There was a line in Michelle's speech, uh, but she said it was it was it was the end. Let's work like our lives depend on it, and let's keep let us keep moving our country forward and go higher. Yes, always higher than we've ever gone before, as we elect the next president and our and vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris and Tim Walz. So, it wasn't quite a repetition of "Go low, go high," uh, but it was a callback. <laughs> I, think, I think it was a bit of a callback uh, with problem. But obviously, it's blended with a lot of you know, you know, roundhouses, and and I've seen some commentary to suggest, oh, she's she's done with that go high business. You know, she brought she brought the heat. But I, I and like there there there's some tension and some paradox in there. But I think they're both trying to communicate. Look, we're not saying you should be chumps. We're not saying you should roll over to the scurrilous stuff that Trump is putting out there, but we need to have some guardrails about it. And we need to keep our eye towards where we need to go as a country. So we so we 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 don't want to win so ugly that we can't govern the place when we're done. I mean that's yeah. that's kind of why that that's I thought the whole of it. Um, so I don't think it's I don't think it ever was our in the first place. I don't think it ever was an argument for you know being soft. And getting steamrolled. Um, I thought of, I thought Barack Obama's speech was very good. 
<clears throat> in terms of the planning of it, right? So you're right. He didn't linger on Joe Biden. He didn't spend a ton of time on Joe Biden. He said exactly the right things about Joe Biden, effusive praise, and then he moved on. And the way he moved on was by talking, as you noted, about hope and change and uh, civility, and those sort of things that are very much in Obama's wheelhouse, um, kind of restoring that vibe. But not only are they, are they in Obama's wheelhouse, but they define the, the Harris Walls ticket. And, and as I said in my piece to, you know, today, it's about joy. That's part of their brand. I mean, that mm. maybe is their brand. And it's a stark contrast to Trump. And by stressing that, that uh, you know, happy warrior mentality, um, I think that Obama really uh, was underlying one of the the central premises of of their candidacy. And this is our third presidential election with Donald Trump as the nominee. And. I don't think either Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden were able to uh, achieve that happy warrior uh, level. No, no. Uh, and, 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 and part of it is that, that Biden's theory on winning was to say that make the election about Donald Trump mm -hmm. and stress the fact that Donald Trump is an existential threat to democracy. How can you run a joyful, fun campaign if the goal is to make it about Donald Trump dis and disqualifying Donald Trump? But look, I'm not, knock I'm not knocking it. It worked. I think, frankly, it's true. It wasn't- Well, it worked, worked for Joe. It didn't work for Hillary. Campaign. It was negative, but it, was, it wasn't scurrilous because it was, it was, but I think that what Kamala and, and, uh, and, and walls are doing is they're not running this kind of campaign that's like, this is the last election if we want to save liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. They're running a more joyful campaign that I think is mocking Trump. Um, but it's, 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 it's not about moral outrage as much. Well, it's just uh, Donald Trump, uh, as, as much of a walking disaster as he is, I mean, as I've said before, I'm, I'm not impressed with Donald Trump's political acumen. He loses far more than he wins. Uh, but he is a tricky opponent. I mean, it, it, he has befuddled many, many candidates, particularly Republican primary candidates, um, because he is he, he goes so low so often, it knocks you off your game. Whatever game plan you have, it, it is hard to go high with Donald Trump. It is hard to maintain happiness with Donald Trump when he's when he's, you know, he's basically punching you below the belt constantly. You know, he finds a way to get under your skin uh, and 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 draw out your outrage to the point where it's hard to put a smile on your face. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's it's easier said than done. But uh, part part of the story, though, is this. When Donald Trump ran against Hillary Clinton, Trump wanted the campaign to be about Trump. And Clinton wanted the campaign to be about Trump. When Donald Trump ran against Joe Biden, Trump wanted the campaign to be about Trump, and Biden wanted the campaign <laughs> to be about Trump. This is the first time, at least for the last month, people were not that interested in Donald Trump. We are excited to watch Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. They are the stars right now. And so they are the Trump isn't sucking up their oxygen. People are following them. People are more interested in them. And so it's a different, totally different vibe. And I think it's also driving Trump crazy. I think it's depressing him. I think it's the the worst psychological warfare possible against Trump is, is to run against someone who is a bigger celebrity than he is. I, I think it probably helps that they're both you know, even though Kamala Harris is sitting vice president, to many people, she's a fresh face. She hasn't had the yeah. same level of media scrutiny um, that uh, that she's now getting. Tim Walls is totally fresh for everybody. You know, Hillary had been in the public eye for three decades. Uh, and Joe Biden has been in public office for, for 50 years. Uh, so uh, it's a it's a different matchup. It's a, not a matchup that he's used to uh, dealing with. And he's having a hard time uh, dealing with it. Now, I want to ask you. Because we haven't talked about day one of the convention much so far. 
Um, do you feel that because are you um, like you were concerned going in? Because I know much because you, you care. You care about Kamala's success. I care. I care so much. <laughs> um, I care about people. You were worried there's, there's going to be too much on the past, too uh, uh, not enough on the future, and so it's it's all it's Biden and it's Obama and it's Clinton, um, it's it's a lot. So day one was was Hillary and and and, and Biden. Um, do you feel that the convention has gotten stuck in the past? Um, uh, this is this is over day one and day two question. Um, yeah. is, is that concern is being validated, or do you feel like hey they're they're navigating this? Uh, so far, so good. I, I, I think it was I think it was fair to sound the alarm um, and to throw this out as like, hey, a potential warning. This campaign is supposed to be about the future. It's supposed to be about Kamala Harris being a fresh face uh, and change. And uh, you've got all these exciting young Democrats who and, and you want to go back to like the past. Right. Um, we, you know, we're not going back. Isn't that the slogan, you know, yeah. and yet we are every night. And so I think it was a legitimate concern. Um, but I think that they have so far managed it well. Now, part of it is I believe Kamala has made an appearance both nights. Yeah, correct. So they're doing things to mitigate it. And I mean, the fact that Joe Biden went on 1130 East Coast time, at mm -hmm. least, might have also mitigated the problem of, uh, uh, you know, of Biden kind of being there. Uh, and, and, you know, being a reminder of of the past. So but I think it was a legitimate thing to be aware of and be concerned about. We're halfway through so far. So good. I do not think it has been a problem. Um, and and uh, what we'll you think about the Biden speech itself? Uh, oh, you know, what? I didn't watch it live. I uh, saw clips. It seemed like Biden and not great, mm -hmm. uh, boring, uh, but nothing catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, it, it, he was, you know, that's, that's as good as Joe Biden can do. Yeah. I, 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 I think it was, I mean, it was sort of a heck of a lot better than the debate. You know, he, it was, it was cogent. Uh, he, um, didn't have any serious, uh, teleprompter stumbles. Um, uh, it was long. Uh, you know, my, uh, my editor, you know, Paul Glastris, who I'm here with in, in Chicago, you know, uh, he felt there was no, there's no narrative theme to it. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Biden has a, a, a story to sell. That just, like it was, it was, it was very State of the Union laundry list. Here's all the things that I've done, but it wasn't tied up in a way that really gets you a broader sense of what the philosophy is, what the direction we're all going. I mean, he has certain platitudes, you know, build the economy from the middle out, not the top down. But I think that's pretty thin as far as like how does this make how is this distinctive from other economic strategies of the past. Yeah. Uh, this wasn't like this wasn't like 1976 when they nominated Gerald Ford, and then Reagan gave a talk and they said we've nominated the wrong man. Like that, mm -hmm. that didn't happen. There was nobody, mm -hmm. nobody saying like, oh, we should have stuck with Biden. No, like, no. I, if anything, it's as 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 appreciative as I think the crowd sincerely is of him. I don't think there's a lot of Biden haters in that crowd, um, but. The energy, like just just the mere appearance of Kamala Harris, just is lighting up that room. Yeah, uh, there like, people are, are sort of itching to get out of their seats and go knock on doors. And By the way, said, did, did you see there was reporting that Kamala Harris did a rally in Wisconsin? I think in Milwaukee yeah. last night, Tuesday night, uh, while the Obamas were in Chicago, and the, the yeah. reporting is that. Um, if Kamala didn't want to be on stage with the Obamas, because that would be perceived by Biden as a slight because the Obamas helped push him out. I saw, I think it was a Fox News report that had that. I mean, I'm not saying it's made up out of whole cloth. I'm sure someone whispered that in that reporter's ear. I still don't necessarily buy it. Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, I've seen enough reporting to believe there are certain tensions between Obama's and the Bidens and Pelosi and the whole thing. Um, but I would think ju just as Kamala did not hesitate to punch Biden in the face about school bus you know, uh, four years ago, like if she thought it made sense for her to be in that hall Tuesday night, she'd be in the hall Tuesday night. I just think they saw an opportunity to squeeze in one more appearance in a swing state, which is a potentially tipping point swing state. Yeah. And maybe sign up 10,000 volunteers to go knock on doors for the people who are in that room. 
think about, pardon the term double penetration, but think about the uh, impact that she had, right? I mean, they've got a, a hall full of delegates in Chicago and a national television audience. Meanwhile, she's packing like a, an arena in Milwaukee full of swing, not swing, in a swing state uh, full of voters. That's a lot. I mean, they're they're maximizing. It's a lot of reach that they're getting by doing I mean, that. I mean, Pretty the smart. point of doing these rallies, what the point should be of doing these rallies if you're running a proper operation, is to get volunteers. You know, you don't always get on TV when you do a rally. You, you, you'll you get a news story. But the way these things have legs is that you're signing people up to go do work for you, particularly in a close race. Uh, I don't know if the Trump rallies are serving that function in the same way, but I'm pretty sure the Democrat rallies are. Uh, so it's one more day to set up one more volunteer that might end up being the difference if, they, if this ends up being a, a game of inches. Uh, Bill, have you, have you bumped into or had any, any problems with protesters, uh, radicals on the streets of Chicago? Is that a, is that a problem for people attending? So when I came in Monday night, um, uh, we so we were driving, we have rental cars, we're driving in, so we and we have two rental cars, the group of people that I'm with. Uh, and one of them had paid for a parking space in a lot and couldn't easily get to that lot because of the marchers and just ended up parking on the street. Mm. Um, and that, 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 that's as much of a problem as it was. I mean, and Monday night was the bigger problem with the, with the protesters, but we had media credentials that allowed us to skip the bigger lines. So I think I think the I think the processing I think I, I think don't hold me to this. I think that the number of checkpoints got minimized at least on Monday because the protest activity we got to skip that line, and so it wasn't a problem for me. Awesome. Well, I know you're busy out there. Any final thoughts or anything we missed uh, before? Well, the one thing that I wrote about on for Monday night that I'd, I'd emphasize is I. You know, the Biden speech was obviously important historically. Um, it was a genuine passing the baton, a defense of the record. I think the crowd had gave him genuine appreciation. Uh, but I thought AOC's speech was the more important speech. Mm. Uh, you know, the day of the biggest protesting around Gaza, uh, an issue where, you know, AOC's sympathies lie with the protesters uh she came into office running against a democratic establishment figure her first moment in dc was to do a sit in nancy pelosi's office at the 2020 convention she didn't say anything about the nominee joe biden she nominated bernie sanders uh she was she second she seconded the nomination of bernie sanders in a 90 second uh, speech although she said on social media i'm gonna vote for biden this is this is symbolic Nevertheless, like she wasn't putting in her heart and soul into saying how great Joe Biden was in, in 2020. In the book, The Squad, written by Ryan Grimm, which I reviewed for the Washington Monthly, the very last page of the book, this was published at the tail end of last year. The very last page of the book is, is AOC musing about running against Joe Biden in the primary, which obviously she didn't do, but it, according to her, it was she was considering it. Uh, and what does she do? At the opening night of the convention, she gives effusive praise for Biden's leadership, quote unquote, and the vision, quote unquote, of, of Harris uh, and Walls. And her mention, she had the first mention of Gaza on the convention floor, but it was to say about how tirelessly Kamala Harris was working to get a ceasefire and to bring the hostages home, uh, a pairing which has been very important to uh, supporters of Israel's right to exist, to say this is not just a one-sided thing that it, the Israel's got to stop shooting. Hamas has hostages that need to be released. She used that pairing. Uh, and there was far more unity in the hall on day one of the 2024 convention than there was on day one of the 2016 convention when a lot of Bernie delegates walked out of the hall and claimed the whole thing was rigged. Now, I think twisting end up getting to a unified place by the end of it, but started off on a rockier note. The only protest in the hall on day one was like 
I'm not sure exactly how many people. It, it might have been as little as three. It was on the other side of where I was. I could see it, but it was on the other side of the hall than I would. That I it was it was stage right, not stage left. I was stage left. But I think on TV you didn't even hear it. It was so tiny. Like there, the banner was unfurled. People blocked it with their "We Love Joe" signs. The there you might have noticed on TV this seeming "We Love Joe" chant coming out of nowhere. That was to drown out the very, very tiny chanting from the protesters and they got ushered out, you know? So uh, I thought AOC's speech set the unifying tone of the, it, 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 if there was going to be anything discorded, it would have started there and it didn't start at all. All right, there you have it. Our man on the ground in Chicago. Bill, if any, I trust if anything crazy happens, we'll do an emergency episode. But <laughs> otherwise, uh, I guess we'll do this next week. Thanks, man, for uh, you know for being there and and uh, and being willing to <clears throat> come into the DMZ. Uh, my pleasure. Check out my uh, dispatches from Chicago at WashingtonMonthly.com and the Washington Monthly Substack. Uh, and, you, and you have your hill come. Anything else you get to plug? That's it. Check out that piece in the hill about. Uh, Kamala Harris and Joy, and we'll see you back here in the in the DMZ next week. Take care.